Well, hello people. We are back with a new Fighting with Moskowitz, Vechten met Moskowitz. And as you can see, I have the great privilege and honor to have as my guest, Mr. Sean Cahill. Welcome, sir. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, being my guest. Thanks for having me, Max. It's nice to meet you finally in the in face to face. Well, you know, I'm really excited for this uh, podcast uh, because you are actually the first person who was in the military and a witness to, uh, you know, what has been uh, leaked by the Pentagon to the mainstream public. Um, so uh, this is exciting for me. So I'm just going to kick this off. Sean, sure. can you please introduce yourself a little bit, uh, you know, as a person? And uh, then I will kick this off uh, with a question, uh, you know, uh, maybe tell your story again. <laughs> Absolutely. My name is Sean Cahill. I'm a retired chief master at arms uh, from the United States Navy. I spent 20 years in the Navy on various ships and at various shore stations uh, working in areas of anti-terrorism, anti-piracy and plans and policy execution. Um, I was present on board the USS Princeton in 2004 during what we now infamously call the Tic Tac incident. I helped coordinate efforts from the bridge and uh, was most probably a witness to those uh, that exotic phenomena in the sky. Most probably. Not sure? Well, I, they wouldn't stop and hold on long enough for me to make sure that they were the Tic Tacs, but they did correspond to the radar data. Um, and they course what I saw in the sky corresponds to what the uh, pilots uh, seem to have saw. So if I, I would never say with assurance that those were Tic Tacs, I couldn't make their shape out. They were only uh, lights uh, from my vantage point. Okay, so we're on that topic already. Uh, please, sir, I know you've told this story so many times, but could you walk me through what happened that sure. day? So I had been uh, receiving telephone calls on the bridge when I was on watch from Senior Chief Kevin Day. He was trying to figure out whether or not the, these tracks that they were picking up on radar were real tracks or whether they were ghosts in the system after they had done a, an upgrade, basically. And so I was up on the bridge taking these calls and I was steering the ship on certain courses to match um, what Kevin needed. And at times I would go out on the bridge wings and I would speak to my lookouts and I would ask them to be extra vigilant uh, for air contacts that may, may or may not be anomalous. But I just had them keep their eyes out for anything in the sky. Um, we were, were in the middle of a anti-submarine exercise. So we knew exactly who was supposed to be there with us. So these were unusual contacts. Um, over the course of days, we kept playing this kind of cat and mouse game with them. And um, I was getting increasingly frustrated trying to figure out why we were doing this um, when suddenly, or not suddenly, when finally uh, Kevin asked me very, very seriously, would you, would you keep your lookout? Would you really, you know, keep looking for this? It's not nonsense. So I was extra vigilant and ended up being out on the port side bridge wing, which is the left side of the ship, facing forward and looking up off of the port uh, bow at approximately 45 degrees at about, around 2,000 feet. There were five to seven lights in the sky, and they began swirling towards the center of this grouping and each individually blinking out and, and disappearing. And it was a crystal clear night. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Um, I'd been in the military for about a decade at that time, and being a chief and being on the bridge, I was very familiar with what could be expected to be seen of any type of aircraft or phenomena out to sea at that point. And I knew that what I had seen was exotic. Um, the next morning, well, when I came out for breakfast in the morning, I saw Kevin and a few other chief petty officers. And, and I was, as I said, I was frustrated. I want to know, I said, Kevin, what the heck are we looking at up there? What do you got me chasing around? And he had a huge grin on his face and he said, go check your email. So I went in the back of the lounge and I pulled up my, uh, my we have a, a divided, a separate internet on board the ship that's secret, that's on the, that's a secret classification. We call it the sipper net. So I logged on to there and I watched a, gun camera footage and read through a series of emails that, that went along with it that showed a craft like I'd never seen before. It was obvious that what I was looking at had no wings. Um, I understood how to read the, the FLIR imagery, so I knew that it was not the temperature I was expecting to see. It had no exhaust plume. Um, there were no tethers to it, so it was not a balloon. And then the movement we were seeing was was 
absolutely astonishing to watch it um, elongate and stretch out as it moves across the screen and to find out that that corresponds with it actually leaving the area just like that uh, was frankly astonishing. Now, I assume you are talking about, of course, the footage uh, we've seen. Uh, uh, yes. One of the... So can you just elaborate a little bit on what went through your mind? What were you feeling when you uh, were aware of that is something that I don't know of? Mm -hmm. Well, at first, when I saw the video, I really thought, this is it. We're, we're looking at whatever beats Roswell. Whatever Roswell wasn't, this is it now. And, and I thought right. to myself, this is incredible. At the time, I really did think, I said, this is going to change history. This is, <laughs> this is insane. How are we not going to immediately go home and, and proclaim this to everyone? Um, when that didn't happen and when my chain of command, my captain and, and the other senior officers on board, when they all reacted so nonchalantly and not even with a great deal of stigma, just about the, the right amount that you would assume, I think, given the time. Um, but we just moved on. No one was astonished or bothered. Everybody thought, well, that was pretty strange. Um, <laughs> none of us were really willing to offer up an opinion because you didn't want to look like a, a kook. Um, so I began thinking this was amazing, and I think I ended the week by the time I pulled back in thinking, well, it was just some some awesome technology that we've developed um, because I couldn't understand how my chain of command could be so, so nonchalant about what was, well, I don't want to say what everybody wants me to say, but obviously something else, yeah. you know, so. Well, um, that sounds like an like an event you you were even thinking about roswell like uh, changing history yeah. well it actually is now <laughs> so you yeah. were kind of right yeah. yeah um okay but were there any explanations that went through your mind you know because that's a very human reflex you know try to explain um right. what what checklist did you go through well for me that it was it was that day or, or the, those days leading up to it were probably the only days I really seriously considered that this was non-human technology. Um, I thought it was kind of, it was amazing. I was, I was at times I was giddy to be involved and at times I was very frustrated to not know Freeze. what was going on. Yeah. And I was, and I, at times I was frustrated that we didn't know what was going on. And other times I was, you know, elated to think that this might be something really, really brand new. Um, it was kind of a roller coaster, but at the same time, we had a job to do. You know, we had we had an exercise to complete. So it's when I think of what it could have been, my mind ranged all over all of the, the science fiction explanations and things like that. But at the end of the day, I just knew that the technology was something that should, outstripped yeah. everything in every magazine I was reading and every book and publication that I kept up with. Right. And in your military career, you said you were already 10 years in. Um, did you ever encounter anything similar or maybe a, a, a little bit? I, uh, while on active duty, I have never encountered anything that was, that even came close to what we saw, um, in and around the events surrounding the Tic Tac incident. And even since with researching DARPA and, uh, advanced technologies in the years, I still have never seen anything that, that has the full suite of, of systems that the Tic Tac seemed to have. So could you maybe uh, describe how these things were behaving? Were they behaving friendly, uh, 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 aggressively? Were they behaving observantly? What would you say? I'd be careful with those because those are, those are human observations. Um, and th those assign motive to what is otherwise an inanimate oh. object. And I want to be careful there. I will say that um, Kevin Day and Commander Fravor, uh, David Fravor, they had both mentioned that they had insights that they felt that these um, objects were aloof to the battle group, that they were kind of going about their own business. Um, they did seem, David Fravor, I believe, did say that they seemed to respond when they came um, into the area and that they were, uh, there was an avoidance system obvious in place. And then the fact that the Tic Tacs allegedly arrived at Commander Fravor's cap point ahead of Commander Fravor indicates some knowledge of their communications. Um, or, well, I don't, I don't want to speculate too much on any 
quantum effects with that because I'm not a I'm not a physicist. Um, but we're looking at such a a strange. It, there, it doesn't okay. fit in the box. It doesn't fit in any box that we have. Right, right. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, what made you think, because you said this in an interview uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, what made you say these things were are so technologically ahead? And you even mentioned 100 to 1,000 years. So now that's, a, that's quite a range. Um, but how did you come up with that assessment? Um, Lou Elizondo stated uh, that we, human beings, might just be 100 years separated from that technology. So how would you how would you come to that assessment and how come Mr. Elizondo thinks we are actually quite close to this te technology? Well, I think some of some of those opinions are because we share some of the same information and we've shared some conversations on the subject together. But where I have gained my data is from reviewing the unclassified defense intelligence uh, research uh, documents that right. came out of ATIP. Um, to me, if we examine Thank you. the level of, please. If oh, we no, examine, I have to. Uh, oh, 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 I see. I see. Thank you, Megan. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. If we Sorry. examine the level of technology that um, that was studied at ATIP, it gives us a picture of what was being observed. If we if we bounce that off of the five observables, we we're, we start to build a picture of the technology that was already accepted as being real. Because at this point, there were programs there to to try to extrapolate and learn from what we were observing. So it, for me, it, it's my opinion. Um, but when I look at the current state of the art in these in the same areas that, that these dirds were were, um, were researching, I see a, a great gap. Now, if we if we talk to theoretical physicists and mathematicians, I think we're going to see less of a gap. They're more comfortable saying that these these are uh, theoretically feasible. But um, without going too far into speculation, the materials that are speculated as to being used, as well as the energy levels are far beyond what we seem to be able to produce right now. Right. Okay. Um, so someone mentioned uh, Senator Blumenthal, uh, who made a statement in 2019, uh, whereas he thinks um, these threats from space uh, are not known to the to the, the mainstream public, and and um, you know he says there there's a real there's a real problem in in space, a real threat. Uh, now, how do you feel about a statement like that? And you now, could you maybe emphasize on what he's stating about that? Sure, I was very um, at first confused by his choice of words. Um, some people think that I've overanalyzed his video and his wording. But to me, it seems that Senator, Senator Blumenthal is indicating um, what I tend to call a, an external entity. It would seem to me that he's indicating someone, um, let's refer to them as others for, for right. the sake of this argument, but someone that he does not seem to be listing as the United States, an ally or an adversary. So if, those are, if, we, if it's none of those, to me, it's something from outside the system we're used to. So, uh, I often describe it as folks who don't have an email address or pay taxes. So mm -hmm. to me, there's a spectrum that can fall on. It depends on whose research you want to lean towards, whether it's a breakaway civilization of humanity or whether we want to get into the really um, exotic explanations like time travel, ultra terrestrials and multidimensionals and, of course, extraterrestrials. Um, right. But I, I don't know. I was I was a cop for 20 years, to put it simply. And I need I need chains of custody. I need evidence that I can hold in my hands. I need data that I can verify and that when I'm all done that I can hand to you and you can go suit through the same process and come to the same conclusions. So Right, right, right. So what made you decide to share your story? There must there must have been a point in your in your life where you felt there is a point of no return and you must have known the consequences to sharing this uh, and the risks. And I commend you for that, sir. Thank you. And thank you for your service also. Um, but uh, could you maybe uh, tell me, it might be a, a bit of a personal question, but I would love to know what made you uh, share your story. Simply, it was Lou. Um, when, when the New York Times article came out, um, and when I read about all of that and I found out about Lou, the first thing that I did was I had to switch gears. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy when it comes to figuring out 
out things. And I, I thought to myself, well, this is obviously real. This is obviously, right. this was obviously not what I thought it was for the last 15 years or whatever the interim was. Um, so frankly, I'm an inherently suspicious person. I immediately began investigating Lou Elizondo, the ATIP program, the history of ufology, the history of governmental programs. And I really peeled back a few layers. And I think like a lot of us, I realized, holy crap, this has been going on since right after World War II. And if you look even further into the history books, you can see that this has been going on for quite a long time. True. And it's a very confusing subject, but it seemed like with the 2004 Tic Tac event and with Lou coming out of, of the shadows, we finally had something we could sink our teeth into and that we might be able to anchor into and get people to pay attention to. So I spent nine months, frankly, trying to find out if, if Lou was just another... Uh, jerk coming out of the with a couple of breadcrumbs and trying to make a buck off of it because we'd seen it before and we see people try yeah. to capitalize on one event for 20 years you know and, and keep milking it um when when he i i contacted to the stars academy and it took nine months for them to get back to me but when right. they did um lou got out within a few weeks with a, a crew from history channel um he interviewed me and then when we finally got the microphones off, I wanted to have a private conversation with him. And he, we right. talked and I said to him, I said, hey, man, if you're not another one of those BSers, um, if you really mean to, in, to figure this out and to let people know what's going on, I said, I'll put my boots back on for you and I'll go back to work for you. Um, and ever since then, it's, it's, it's been my pleasure and my honor um, to work with him. But he's, he's quite a friend, but damn it, he's he's a courageous professional and i don't think a right. lot of us would be where we are today having this conversation if, if he and chris mellon hadn't had the 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 cojones yeah the cojones to to, to <laughs> tell those right now trying to be <laughs> trying, trying not to be vulgar for the audience here that's fine by the way thank you my friend Vinny from disclosure team uh he's going to start his own youtube channel soon sean you should really be his guest he's an amazing dude i would love to i'd love to i know i think he's in my uh, in my email right now i have to i have to write him back oh you should you should he's a great guy i now have to figure out how yeah there we go <laughs> continue um um so, you know, you, you, you saw the footage uh, from the Nimitz, you, you heard the, the David Fravor story, you have seen the data with your own eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, is there more from that same well, ship? Mm, well, we know that the radar data hasn't, we haven't seen the radar data yet. We know that it existed because that's what we did. We were a radar we were the air defense commander. We were the radar platform. And we know from Gary's, um, Gary Voorhees account and uh, some accounts on board the USS Nimitz that some entity from the United States government came on board both ships and took that data. Um, I still haven't identified them yet. I don't know who they are. A lot of people have said, well, black? you were the, pardon me? Men in black? Well, that, you know, that's, that's, that's the, that's the you know the jokey term for it because they were allegedly in civilian clothes and everything. But I mean, no reports right. of Will Smith or, or Tommy Lee Jones. Um, <laughs> I don't. Hey, if we're gonna you know we gotta we gotta joke be able to joke about it where it's appropriate. But sure. um, it a lot of people have said to me, well, you were you were the sheriff. You should have known who was coming and going from your ship. And I was the sheriff. I wasn't the the border patrol guard and the bag check guy and everything else. You know, we had, we're a Navy ship. We have an itinerary. So if, if, if the carrier says there's a helo coming over with passengers, we say, Roger that. And we safely land the bird and we figure it out after there. So, but were you, were you witness to, to these men just entering the ship and, and, no. and uh, rummaging around? No. No, but had, so an example would be, had I been on board the, if I was on the bridge when that helo landed and, and we used to, we used to um, go to flight, what we call it is flight quarters. We steer a specific course to get a specific um, airspeed and windage across the, uh, across the, the flight deck of the ship to, to land the bird. When we do that, we're just concerned with the safety. So the people up on the bridge are, are just saying, okay, how many passengers are coming and going? 
And um, later on in the day, I might have gotten them linen or something, excuse me. But um, I, I would never have been, it wouldn't have been reported to me if someone came on board the ship, went to the combat information center, showed credentials, ordered someone to hand over tapes, and then had them sign an NDA and be quiet. That's that's not my business. I don't have a need to know that if it occurred. So, I get it. I get it. Um, but but then again, you know, you, you witnessed this, but there were of course multiple witnesses. You weren't alone. Uh, sure. Was there a was there a debrief for you guys? Um, you know, uh, was there something explained to you? What the hell this was you saw? Uh, was there an explanation? And were you questioned about this? My the question. answer across the board is is pretty much no. Um, the evening that I saw the the morning that I woke up and saw the video uh, that we all saw it in our inboxes and got to watch it. Those of us who had access, uh, we had a, our normal operations intelligence briefing that night. The only difference was that I was asked to stand at the door and ensure that anyone who didn't have a clearance and that was turned away didn't give the person with the list a hard time. Um, right. But after that, I came into the um, back into the lounge and we, we got ready for our briefing. And when the PowerPoint presentation was started, a little um, cartoon type Mars attacks, little alien with a in a spaceship went across the screen and everybody kind of laughed. And we, we mm -hmm. talked about it for a minute while we explained it to the folks who didn't know what was going on. And then the captain said, well, we all had our fun. Now let's get back to work. And that was the that was it. Literally it. There was no debriefing. There was no discussion. And most of us just kind of let it slide. Um, I think I'm sure Kevin and I a few times were like, hey, what do you think that was and discussed it and everything. But there was there was really nothing you could do with it. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's such a it's it's so weird, you know, that people just move on from something like that you've never seen before. But, you know, many times I've discussed this, uh, you know, uh, taking the, the, the example of the Na Native Americans first seeing the Spanish ships uh, in front of the coast, the Aztec people. Right. Mm -hmm. Some weren't able to see them. Right. Yeah. Some were just ignoring it, you know, because their mind couldn't even comprehend whatever this was. They hadn't seen it before. So it's a it's it's a weird human thing, uh, weird psychology. But then again, there are others who do see them and they're like, do you see that? <laughs> you know, and you you were one of them. Yeah. But uh, yeah. let me see. Um, Have you ever spoke to a um, high-ranking officer about your experiences or maybe anyone in charge uh, at the time? Yes, uh, in the last few years I have, but not when I was on active duty. No, at no time when I was on active duty did I ever encounter anything that legitimized uh, anything regarding what we call UFOs. Um, since then, I've had the opportunity to meet, meet quite a few people um, behind the scenes, um, a couple of four-star uh, admirals, in fact, and yeah. I've been able to communicate with some folks who are who are tangential to some of the programs we're talking about. And um, it's there is definitely a cadre of, of professionals within the United States government who have been taking this seriously for longer than the two of us. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm 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 starting with my hard questions now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get a lot of hard ones, so this will be fun. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but what I'm really curious, uh, what I'm really curious about, there seems to be a separation in the DoD in the Department of Defense between high-ranking uh, officials who are addressing this topic and 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 ranking people who really, really uh, uh, fanatically resist this. Um, have you ever encountered, um, well, let me let me ask this question. If you would say that the, the, the high ranking officers you talk to, did they ever let you know they were uh, f having a lot of resistance within their own ranks? Yes. Um, when I first encountered this subject years ago, one of the concerns that was that seemed to be prevalent was with um, I want to be careful because I don't want to offend anybody, but with um, a neoconservative Christian um, cadre who believed that this was a subject that shouldn't be addressed whatsoever. Right. 
And that was due based on their own personal religious convictions. Beyond that, and that seems to be something that we that we seem to have, um, I don't want to say defeated, it just seems to be something that it's not an issue at the moment. Uh, it seems right. to be not holding anyone back. But there is a there's a there seems to be also a cadre within the Department of Defense that is trying to get in between the process of the rest of us knowing what's going on with the FOIA process. It seems they're siphoning the data off to the side to do quality assurance before it goes out to us. Um, there's the government's I, uh, in, Inspector General report uh, that's coming out that we should expect on on them investigating the fact that this is a reality. So in, in an investigation, investigating the investigation. Um, the, the Inspector out, General? Yeah. I'm talking about, yes, the Inspector General report that is that is being generated by the, the DOD IG. Yeah. Oh, you know. Um, and then you've got peripheral um, personal investigations that are that are being talked about that are obviously, I would assume, going to intertwine with these larger investigations and possibly even inform the details behind them. So the question is, is are we dealing with a bureaucratic arm of the government we're not aware of that has their own plans and policy to obfuscate this this topic? Or are we dealing with individuals who are either receiving orders or carrying out their own personal agendas. Um, that's that's what I hope is revealed through this so we can get to the information. Now, I spoke to Lou Elizondo uh, a week ago and uh, he, he talked about this, you know, the, the same problem actually. And he said, this is sometimes just a religious problem, you know, um, that's when you know one of one of the very one of the vi very high ranking people may, maybe the same guy you talk to said don't worry about it we already know what these are it's demons right which that, that, is it's short sighted it, it shows a right. lack of yeah. imagination in a very large universe and it discounts the rest of us it's that's not the um it's not the governmental structure and constitutional uh, understanding that I have of how my country operates. Um, I protect someone's right to think that, but they don't get to think for the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like, like shallow, narrow mindedness might be just the problem here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but let, let me, let, let, let us move on uh, a little bit more. Um, have you ever been involved in an invest in in this investigation uh by the dod or the u uh uaptf uh secret service pentagon on what you've witnessed have you ever cooperated uh with that no i've never been asked to provide a uh, official accounting of what's happened i have given a uh, unofficial accounting to some officials within the organizations that you've mentioned uh but no i've never been asked to go on record you should. <laughs> I would hope so. Um, let me see. Okay. Uh, I've heard you say you entertain the idea uh, this might, might not even be human. Human-made UAPs. Now, um, what made you entertain that conclusion or that, that theory? Well, I think um, a lot of us are, are very comfortable with looking up at the night sky and through it through a telescope. I'm an amateur astronomer, um, and and I'm just a science geek in general when it comes to astronomy, astrophysics, and, and physics in general. Um, I have no problem wrapping my head around the fact that we live in, in a near-infinite universe as far as we might as well be concerned. So the possibilities to me are endless. Um, to me, I, I kind of visualize us at the bottom of this gravity well, kind of staring up and just constantly assuming that we're the only thing that's here. Um, that's ridiculous to me. I've watched us do it throughout our history and come and go with those ideas. Um, but our science has, has gotten us to a point where we can kind of look behind the curtain where we, we may not be able to replicate these technologies yet, but we can show that the structure of our universe or perhaps even our multiverse um, it, it presents a quite different reality than, than the linear reality the rest of us are used to. So I'm very open-minded as to what this can be. And since it doesn't seem to be shooting us down willy-nilly or, or landing and taking over, 
um, I'm more open-minded um, as, as to us reaching out and learning more from it. Yeah, look, uh, on the evolution, evolutionary line, we're, we're really young. You know, if you if you take into account that the Earth is millions, 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 hundreds of millions of years old, dinosaurs were here about hundred million uh, millions of years ago. We are just fifty thousand years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Silurian you, hypothesis yeah. uh, is is an absolutely workable hypothesis to assume that in the millions and millions of years that that dinosaurs and sauropods and and frankly uh, even in, insects were on Earth that they could have advanced to a point and gained sentience. We, we're very, there's a lot of hubris in us thinking that we're going to find that when we don't even have a complete picture of our own DNA and, and racial history and evolutionary path. So it's a possibility. They could be, uh, they could be local brothers and sisters. Yeah. If you, for example, take into account blue eyes, are only 5,000 years old. It's a mutation that happened 5,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that's crazy. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's just so young. Uh, hey, look at that. Thank you so much. NMUAP. Uh, oh, here's a question. Does Sean know if we have tried to contact these UAPs and or have we engaged with these contacts? Well, Sean, great question. For you, I so. don't. I don't know of any uh, any official program where the U.S. government um, tried to initiate contact with UAP. Um, I'm. Sh I would imagine that at some point someone did. Uh, of course, we have rumors throughout the years, um, and then I think most of us are familiar with a lot of civilian efforts uh, through what are called you know meditation contact modalities and things yeah, like that. Yeah, remote viewing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm open to those uh, hypotheses and those as possibilities, but they have to be done in a, as in as much of a scientific environment as we can, with checks and balances and oversight, and not just done by um, you know an average person who's going to put it on Reddit and claim it's a truth. Yeah, I, I hear my feed is breaking up, uh, but uh, is all of it breaking up? Because Sean, you are breaking up sometimes a little bit, uh, bit with me, but then I get it back in the delay. But I guys, uh, but guys, I, I hope you can follow everything. We're not going to quit this because uh, you know we're on a roll here. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thank you for your donation, by the way, uh, NMUAP. Um, okay. Well, many of your colleagues have uh, witnessed uh, the same event at the same time. You know, are some of the people you know, you know, who witnessed what you saw, are, uh, still afraid to speak out about this or hesitant to speak out? How do you feel about that? People just, you know, feeling uncomfortable with telling their story. I know some people who were who were present for the incident um, who aren't interested in lending their um, their piece of it. They don't see it as important, and they they don't want the um, the attention that comes along with it. I do understand that um, as a as a possible eyewitness and as someone who was I saw myself as the, since I was the sheriff and I knew what Kevin was doing, and I I was there present to see it with with my own eyes. Possibly, you know, I remembered stuff. I saw myself as one of the checks and balances in this. Um, and yeah. I, I had a long conversation with my wife before we decided to, to come out and, and say this. I said, our life may change. People may look at me differently. They may question my sanity. They may question your sanity for being around me. Um, yeah. And we've, we've experienced that. So um, there are people who don't want to deal with it. But um, I didn't feel like I had a choice to an extent. Wow. Look at Jack Ryan. Thank you for your donation. Andy has a question. When you look at the amount of pilots that have come forward in all of the armed forces, we only have three pilots from two incidents spanning over the course of two decades. Where are the other pilots? Oh, they're there. <laughs> I know. Oh, that yeah, I was going to say, Jack, those are you got some work <laughs> cut out for you because um, you may just be arriving to this, but there are countless military service members, especially pilots. Um, you Worldwide. Can't Yes, yes. It's it's very simple to find. Um, yeah, no, yeah. no offense in that, but yeah, you got to look again, man. You know what, Jack? I'm going to uh, uh, throw some uh, in the feed later on. You know, you can check them out. They're really cool. Thank you so much again. 
All right, let's move on. Um, Yeah, can you explain to me what it means to speak openly and publicly about this as a former military man? Um, and have you had uh, the DOD bullying you or the Pentagon bullying you because you did this? Because you speak, you're speaking out. Well, I, I speak from a platform where I understand that I have Lou standing right next to me, um, backing me up. I got Chris Mellon standing next to me, backing me up. And that's very uh, empowering. Um, and I was quiet the entire time until those folks came out. So I don't want to act like I'm some hero or anything like that. Um, I had a lot of backup when it when it came time to speak. Um, on the one hand, it, there's there's pride involved um, because it, this is a heck of a it's a heck of a conversation to have, and we've never been able to have it. We've been trying to have it for 70 years, and it's broken down every time, and it's it's ruined people's lives, um, and a lot of people have been hurt in the process. Uh, I'd really like to see that end. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's the thing that I think tugs at me the most is ch is changing that conversation and reducing harm around the subject. There's going to be smarter yeah. people that'll come along and figure the rest out. So sure, yeah, well, we'll get to Lou and and what's happening to him uh, a, a bit later, but uh, you know we, we're gonna have to talk about that. <laughs> My God, um, right? Um, well, actually, let, let's address it right now. What do you think of loose deleted mails? And, and why the hell would they do that? It's probably saved anyway, you know? What happened? What, what are they thinking? Whatever this opposition is that we're looking at, it's, uh, it's, it's almost a farce in how amateur and um, lack of effort it's it is. I don't understand what's going on. Um, those emails are a matter of record. Um, it's the illegality of it is the least of the things that, that, um, that offends me, I suppose. It's just, right. th this is not the country that I served for 20 years where we just get to pick and choose the rules that we want to follow. We have a constitutional process here and now they're trying to erase the personage of a man who served that apparatus, both in uniform and out for more than 20 years. And it's disgusting to me that they would be willing to do that rather than face the consequences of the past. But they contradict themselves, right? First, they deny Lou had anything to do with the Pentagon, ATIP investigations. And now they do admit they were having email correspondence and deleted that. Yeah, That is like totally contradicting because why would you delete something if the guy never even worked for for that organization so it's just you know they must really think we are all idiots or something well it makes the public affairs officer look less like someone who's supposed to communicate truth to the public and someone who is actually the propaganda officer because right. it's not that office's job to curate any of this data they're just a site they're just a spigot that gets opened and closed as the need occurs Right. And what do you think is going on right now? Because we talked a little bit about this, this little civil war that's going on right now, uh, the little civil space war. Um, but what do you think is going on right now between the uh, uh, Department of Defense, the Inspector Ge General and the UAPTF and anyone involved? What, what, who has what objective at this point? I'm, 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 I'm kind of lost right now. I do understand that. I think uh, the mo the waters have been muddied a lot by a lot of the popular conversations surrounding the UAPTF. Their tasking is set out by Congress and set out in writing. So what a lot, a lot of people may want may not be what's coming. It may just, if we, we're going to get what they were tasked with. If we get more than that, that's the cherry on top. Um, I don't understand at the moment other than the fact that there's no overarching authority and and i almost feel like the the joint chiefs and um and and the other the other folks back there in the pentagon who are policy makers are really watching this right now to try to figure out which way to lean but it's it's a mess there's no one that's willing to stand up and order this nonsense to stop frankly um, there, there should be someone within the Department of Defense that's willing to stand up for Lou Elizondo at this point and say, this is enough. Uh, the fact that you're you're deleting emails, you're, you're subjugating the FOIA process, 
and you've been caught red-handed so many times now, your best excuse is, well, who cares at this point? And and that's that's unacceptable from the Department of Defense. Definitely, definitely. Um, let me see. Um, well, th this was an in interesting um, remark by uh, Senator Mellon, Christopher Mellon. Uh, and this was when you, you guys were kind of elaborating on what this could be uh, and if it could be ET, right? And Mellon stated they found us before we found them. Now, now that is quite that is quite a statement. What do you think about that? Well, the former Under Secretary of Defense uh, Mellon did state that, that 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 was a possibility that perhaps another uh, race in this immense universe has found us before we found them. I'm totally okay with that possibility. Um, I, I, it doesn't bother me. It thrills me. I find it to be magical. If they're not here as conquerors, then perhaps they're here as something more akin to brothers or at least neighbors. But I am concerned that if they have been here as long as the record seems to show and we don't know who, what, et cetera, they are, is there going to be a time when they reveal themselves to us or are they completely aloof of us? So there's there's a gulf there. Um, that's why when people ask about contacting them, um, I, I'm curious, have they tried to contact us? Well, they did. You know, if you take into account, they have been destroying our nuclear weapons. <laughs> it's destroying is a very, very strong word. I don't have any reports reports of destroyed weapons, but I will say okay. that if they are affecting their the way they operate, uh, yeah, I'm I'm on with you. So if we're just talking semantics here, that's uh, that's no problem. Yeah, messing with our nukes. Um, it's a form of contact. I would yes, it is. Uh, it's a very strong form of contact. The question is, is are we reading it right? And I dare say it's not a um, it's not a coherent form enough of contact for us to to do anything but be on guard. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, you know, I've talked to a. About a metaphor about my son, when I see him playing with the matches, you know, and he's about, you know, to flick one off, I'll just take it from him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, nuclear weapons, uh, you know, look, I'm afraid my son is going to burn down the house. But, mm -hmm. you know, with, with nukes, you can destroy this planet easily, you know, with, with the power, the most powerful ones, you know, and it might interrupt with a a large a bigger balance in 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 the universe right if, if if something happens here on that scale that might really mess with a certain balance i have the feeling and um you know it's all theory you know that's just me but you know i i feel we shouldn't have those we shouldn't have <laughs> I tend to agree with you. I'm not a fan of nuclear proliferation whatsoever. I'm not, I'm not happy in the least that we've taken steps backward um, and that we're considering developing new nuclear weapons at this point. These things don't seem to make sense to me, but I'm a progressive and I, I believe in the advancement of culture and human rights. So right. it's, it's, it's a very hard thing to look at because I'm with you that we're on the one hand, if we're gonna, if we're gonna you know, hypothesize a little bit, if this is a force, I'll even back off and won't even say force. If this is a group of other entities um, that are now coming here and contacting us or whether they've been here or not, um, and we're going to share this space together, if they are going to be neighbors, I imagine they'd be really concerned finding out that we, that we have these hair trigger destructive weapons throughout the heartlands of our major powers across the world, ready to, to go off at any moment. On the other hand, if they're not interested in being friends and they're here to subjugate or take, uh, the first thing they would probably want to do is come in and shut those systems down. So I make it very clear that I don't sell a threat narrative, but I like to look at the whole spectrum of the idea. That's why I, I would very much like for them to tell us who they are in, in a plain as day way. And to me, they're, they're, technology indicates they should be the one to initiate this conversation well you know uh you said you know they they don't really uh, show themselves but my uh, countryman jost de leister has a very compelling question 
uh, if the UAP show themselves openly to Navy ships, planes, and more, this seems kind of, you know, uh, they're exposing themselves. And you could interpret it as a sort of a, yeah, attempt of to communicate or, or an invitation, maybe. One could. But I would ask you the same question. What's that dolphin I see down at the beach trying to tell me? How should I interpret that? <laughs> well, I speak dolphin. So does J Jazz Shaw, by the way. You should know that. <laughs> no, look, uh, it, it, it's hard to interpret what's going on. But like uh, showing lights, you know, that is a look. We have Morse, you know, uh, maybe maybe they are trying to show us. Maybe they are trying to show us a way to communicate. Maybe you should. Maybe scientists should look into that, but they won't, you know, mm -hmm. because they are also afraid to to uh, address this topic, which really pisses me off, by the way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that if if we're able ac able to have access to the data, you know, a lot of uh, people have brought that up with me again, and I don't mean to be contrarian, but at the same time, I say, well, there are a lot of reasons to have lights. There are a lot of things that emit light, um, and you know, if they're according to an FAA pattern, I imagine that they're that those are terrestrial aviation, and if um, it, you know, there are a lot of things we can extrapol extrapolate from these, from this. And I think that you're correct though, when, you know, the scientists, as we say, they need to have full access to the unclassified data and Definitely. those, the scientists who can attain classification and understand how that works without getting wrapped around the axle of give us all the secrets, th they need to attack this within the realm of government and classification where that has to be done. Um, it's time to not pretend that this is just for entertainment and for convention circuits and, and things like that. Um, this needs to become a real curriculum. Yeah, it's it, Lou Elizondo is almost like a scientist when you talk to him. He knows Absolutely. a lot about quantum physics, you know, math. Um, and he showed me a week ago this really interesting... Uh, uh drawing let's say that because my question to him was why do we see these different kind of shapes of uaps in the sky why mm -hmm. is it uh sometimes uh, an orb uh, or a cigar or a tic tac or a, a uh um uh, how do you call it <laughs> the triangle a, a saucer yeah uh, yeah but he then, uh, and I asked him, you know, do they have like uh, maybe a certain skill set or a certain task, uh, you know, which goes with the shape? Now, he, I, may, I, I don't know if he, he has done that for you, but he um, made this drawing and let's say he uh, explained like the, the shape and what they were observing kind of. And then he was putting them together, you know, two orbs, a saucer, blah, 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 blah. And in the end, a perfect, <laughs> a perfect triangle, you know, and I was, my mind was just blown. By the way, guys, if you haven't seen that, check out that episode because that was amazing. But, but ha have you ever seen that theory? I have. There's, um, there do seem to be, uh, now I, I'm a fan of saying form follows function. But that's a very right. human thing to say. When I see a fighter aircraft, it looks menacing to me. It doesn't look like a, a cute, cuddly little blimp or something like that. And don't get me wrong, a, a blimp could drop bombs easily. But mm -hmm. um, but that said, yes, Lou has has shown me that. And so I feel like that's a that's something that's important to understand that we're not always exactly sure what we're looking at. We may be seeing something that we think is an immense black triangle that may be three orbs in in an equilateral formation, um, yeah. and and as you said, um, we've we've when we look at the agua agua dolce uh, video, yes, you know yes. we see two we see two orbs leave the water, and in fact, I have a friend of mine um, in Las Vegas who was doing some imagery analysis, and he believes that he's discovered that they were two orbs right before right at the beginning of the video. They were two orbs that came together to transit the city before going into the ocean. Um, a lot of these things do correspond. Now, where that fits in with something like a classic saucer, I don't know. But um, as far as these orbs go, I do think we need to reconsider our, our perception sometimes with what we're seeing. You know, we're assuming we're seeing triangles where we may just be seeing orbs in a triangular formation. Yeah. Well, it was so interesting to me. Um, 
look, we are, we live in times where this is getting to be mainstream very fast now, yeah. <clears throat> because of you, sir, because of Lou, uh, because of Harry Reid. You know, uh, mainstream media is catching on, and this train is unstoppable now. You know, uh, it, it is really mainstream. CNN is covering it in Holland now. The biggest newspaper they won't stop writing about it anymore. You know, mm-hmm. uh, which is a great thing. Um, but now. Um, former president starts speaking out about this. You might have seen my interview with uh, Senator Reid last week. Um, and, you know, he's very, he has very close ties to, to uh, former President Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, Barack came out uh, at uh, James Corden's uh, show, which is, a, you know, a comic talk show. And... Uh, the musician uh, asked, uh, got to ask a question, and he asked him, you know, the UAPs, is it a real thing? In that show, <laughs> he, for the first time, I think uh, uh, an actual former president, you know, uh, disclosed, he knew about that stuff, and they were talking about that. Now, yeah, I talked to, uh, to Barack about that. I was <laughs> just laughing about it. But to me, it was mind-blowing. I was like, God, Obama knew, yeah. right? Uh, and now, uh, you know, uh, Reed confirming this and, um, you know, confirming he discussed this with Barack. Now, um, Trump wanted to come out with this. Uh, you know, Clinton has been, you know, kind of hinting towards it. Bush says, yeah, well, if I knew it, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it's just surpassed mainstream media. It's now like our... our the, the biggest leaders of the world are, are, you know, entertaining, not entertaining. They are confirming, yeah, 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 we were uh, investigating that. And if you now make the, a little switch back to Lou Elizondo and, and ATIP and they just disqualify his work and former presidents disclosed, yeah, no, we were investigating that. That must mean Lou uh, has spoken to Barack Obama. He must have uh, spoken to Trump, you know. Uh, what do you think, Diddy? I think that those are those are distinct possibilities. Um, I don't have any direct evidence that that whether um, Lou has given any classified briefings to those people or not. Um, but I would say that the the program that exists now is is doing its best to be taken seriously, and I think that it is at certain levels. Now, whether uh, President Obama came out and spoke because he saw the, the backup of folks like Lou, the UAPTF, uh, and, and other, other elements like that, uh, yeah. or whether he received a direct briefing, I don't know. Uh, it seemed like Lou was unable to get the information he needed to up the chain of command. But then again, I don't wanna be, um, I don't wanna act immature and act like that means the information never left his office um i right. would imagine at some level there's got to be a water cooler conversation that even happens at the executive level yeah water cooler conversation you know i see reed and obama like in a joke <laughs> standing around the water cooler I, talking I, about you you are real <laughs> real people these are real people those are colleagues <laughs> that serve together on you know um and and whether one's the president and one's the majority leader or not at the time it's they're still colleagues i think i i remember as a child when the opposition used to play golf together so um times may have changed but uh, i i don't see any problem yeah i'm sh- i'm sure they're f- that folks know what's going on i think it's very courageous of president obama to make the statements that he has um and i right. also understand why president biden has to be very careful with the ones that he makes too well I didn't know Biden could run at that age. Did you see that at the press conference? Yeah, he's quite fit. Uh, yeah, it's quite impressive. Mr. Biden, you are uh, UAPs. <laughs> he did. He bowled no. he got the heck out of there. But I also <laughs> I wonder, I I wonder how much, yeah, how much has he wrapped his head around it? Because even, you know, we're all people at the end of the day. And whether he's the president or not, he's still um, a gentleman who has who may have not had to face the reality of this his whole life and so i think there is a personal psychology element to this we see people who as you said not all the aztecs saw the conquistadores ships and let's right. be real once they came on shore and started decimating the population i'm sure there were people who didn't see that happening either so yeah. there's always a level of denial across our whole society we have to be willing to look at 
Definitely. By the way, NMUAP, thank you again for donating. Uh, are these Snoopy and Viper teams stationed on every ship? I don't know what those are. Maybe you could tell me. So the Viper teams are a new team. Uh, we didn't have a Viper team when I was on board. A Snoopy team uh, will be on any ship that has, usually any ship. Um, I think on a patrol craft, your Snoopy team might be a collateral duty assigned to just about anybody. But to fill in the audience, a Snoopy team would be uh, your intelligence specialists who uh, would be, and your cryptological technicians, those on board the ship who work in intelligence would be called to go up on deck with uh, high quality photographic equipment and other, um, possibly other devices to collect data on an object, vessel, aircraft, etc. Right. Okay. Thank you, NM UAP, again for your donation. Um, yeah. So, okay. One of the most interesting people talking about this maybe was Donald Trump um, because he started talking about Roswell. You know, he said he uh, had, had, um, had a briefing about that. He saw some uh, files and uh, I think it was his uh, son-in-law asked him about it, Kushner, and he said, yeah, what I've seen, it was very interesting, very interesting. Now, um, are you there, Sean? I am, I'm right you. here. Uh, oh, man, you can sit really still because I thought we were frozen. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, so, um, you know, I, I heard there, there was this rumor because uh, the Israeli uh, former director of the, the Israeli space program, uh, Chaim Eshed, uh, dropped a biography and he said some wild shit. I don't know if you uh, heard about that. <laughs> yeah. Now, Chaim, <laughs> look, this is a man who had been running, you know, the, the, the Israeli space program for decades and decades. He is very, very respected in Israel. He's a highly ranked uh, military man. Now, Chaim is 87 years old and decided to drop a biography, clean slate, you know, uh, and said, yep, Space Galaxy, Federation of uh, Nations have a base on, I think, the moon or Mars, and uh, the Americans are in contact with uh, ETs. And... Um, also stated that Trump was about to reveal uh, a lot of stuff to the American or the, the earthly population about what he knew. And apparently they, uh, they quickly uh, muzzled him. What do you think they did? You know? Well, people aren't going to like me for saying this, but prove it. Um, is he friends with the president, the former president? Where did he get that information? As an investigator, oh, no, I have a thousand, a thousand questions. Look, um, uh, it was all, f yeah. Okay. you know. Yeah, I, I guess for me, it's like I, I, my question is, how does he know what the president was going to or not going to reveal? Why does yeah. he have that insight? Who is he? I understand who he was, and those are his opinions in his book. But I don't have his opinions. Um, I, I, I hate to say this, but prove it. There's so many stories and books and people who claim things. And there, there are plenty of folks who have high station uh, within government and, and other things who, who have who believe that their opinions are facts. Um, right. You like know, Paul Hellier. Yeah, there, there, and I don't, I don't want to call anybody out, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of folks out there. I'll, I'll, I'll call out. Um, I think it's Annie Jacobson's book. Her, her, hers is it's a one source theory. Um, and she, yeah. she said, that's it. That's what's going on because I trust this person. And I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. So I say that, that if, if, if the good doctor can, can prove that to the rest of us, I think that's incredible. And we should seriously get started on a lot of different things to ensure that that goes smoothly. If we are really bumping into an exo political situation that is going to present itself in a way that we can, we're going to be able to understand. And that seems to be the way that he describes it. Right. But it seems also like an idea we're ready for. Yeah, that's what he said. You know, uh, he, you know, the, the biggest claim uh, was, you know, he, he felt humankind is ready for this. And he also claimed, you know, it was the government's uh, sweeping, uh, you know, th th this idea or, or this truth under the carpet because they were afraid, you know, probably we're going to get into trouble, the, the trouble we are facing right now with 
you know, uh, ethics, religion, uh, you know, the, 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 the huge change. All our axioms are going to be gone, you know. Life will be changing 180 degrees. But, you know, it's true, you know. I, I do think some people are not ready and will always put their heads in the ground. But I do think there's enough people who, you know, would be open-minded enough to actually, yeah, face this. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. I, yeah. So, Chaim, you know, come with proof, dude. Come on. That, that's, I mean, that's what we would expect for the least of us. If I if I said something spectacular like there were space hippos um, on Mars, it, I better be able to prove it. It's it's otherwise it's just an opinion, and so we shouldn't use our station to. I, anyways, let me stop there. I don't want to disparage anybody. I'm not saying he's full of it. I just want to see the goods. Well, he, he was dropping a biography. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Let's be real and, here. Hold yeah. on. And he, you know, and and we're talking about it. So, uh, let me see this. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was you who said this, or it might, no, it might have been Harry Reid, uh, that the data from Skinwalker Ranch is important enough to be looked at. Why is that? Well, that's a good question. Um, as I'm fond of bookending things in a spectrum, I think that when we um, when we think of a tip, there's one end of the spectrum that deals with nuts and bolts craft that um, we're more comfortable talking about that we can wrap our head around. But there were effects and observations and theories that came out of Skinwalker Ranch that was part of the earlier program that became a tip um, right. that bring up some questions about how reality operates. And uh, I think it'll, it's a good question is where the where, what we call this nuts and bolts portion of the phenomena, where it plugs into the observations from Skinwalker Ranch. So I look forward to learning more about that. I hope that the UAPTF is able to bring more information out of that as well. Yeah, you broke up a little bit. Could you maybe go back one sentence or something? Sure. I look forward to the uh, to the UAPTF possibly being being able to tell us more about Skinwalker Ranch and what some of the conclusions that came out of there was. And frankly, um, the the television show notwithstanding, is the is the phenomena still occurring there in the Unitaw Basin? Yeah. So th this is something I, I've been wondering about because it's not just UAPs or UFOs. It's also I hear things about like entities demons uh ghosts uh paranormal stuff which really throws me off a little bit you know because i i'm not there yet to to you know to me uh uaps are not paranormal anymore to me they're normal right. i'm not saying what it is you know it could be alien et but it could also be something else uh adversary or human whatever but you know, if if something you know is, if so, if if Skinwalker is also investigating ghosts and demons and witches and and that kind of stuff, it kind of throws me off. But you know, what is it about that place that that is so interesting, and why is there so much data to get? I'm not. Well, how does this happen? What, what what's the reason for that? I think those are the questions that we want to ask. Um, in a lot of ways, I think a good place for us to start looking is into our indigenous cultures and some of our older traditions. Like you, some of the things that we call paranormal, I'm not comfortable immediately linking with my day job of talking about nuts and bolts UAP. But yeah. at the same time, what shouldn't we study? If we had, see, I, wa I watched something today. I'd like to bring it up. I actually saw it on TikTok, but it was it was an older... 1970s science presentation or something, but but the man was talking about the fact that within academia, the only thing that's respected is peer review, and that if it's not peer review, it doesn't exist, and there's so little observational science being done in the field that if it doesn't reach these people via peer review, they don't believe it. Well, there's observational data on the paranormal. Um, there's quite a bit of it, and I'm not comfortable with it either like you because it's so full of bullshit in the past, but... yeah. But now, hold on a minute. Some it looks okay. like it looks like the government said, "Let's take another look." There's some weird crap going on out here, right? And right. so let's see the data. It's it's uncomfortable, but at some point, yeah, it looks like this is going to be about more than just the single point 
phenomena everybody wants to look at. Yeah, sure. You know, Robert Bigelow, he, I, he, you know, he re it reminds me of Salvador Dali somehow. Hmm. But um, yeah, <laughs> but the thing about. But the thing about him is, um, I, I think he's also very much looking into consciousness, you know, life after death. What, what, where does your spirit go? Where does your energy go? Um, you know, does life cease when you die? Or is this just a vehicle of flesh and bones and water? Um, you know, it is, I think, proven now that energy really doesn't cease. You know, it, it moves on or goes into something else. You know, when I die, I want to be put into the ground and I want a tree right on top of me and it can feed from my body. And, you know, for some reason, you know, I, I will continue to live on in, 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 in something organic. I, I, I entertain that idea. But I feel, you know, that might also be something that could happen to your consciousness or your, your spirit or say, you know? Um, so that idea i find i do find very interesting uh and also taking into account i i've all, i've talked to many people about this but whenever i see the 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 footage of the uaps mm -hmm. it reminds me of a dream a reoccurring dream i have all the time it's the flying dream right so i walk up to the window you know i stand on the edge just let myself fall over and I'll just get be taken away on a summer night. I'll fly over Amsterdam, move at will as fast as I want or as slow as I want, hover as I want. In a snap of a finger, I'll just go to New York, hover above Times Square, you know. That I do in my dream with my consciousness, you know. I, I go there, you know. Um, when people have a horrible accident and lose their arm, you can get a bionic arm and move the thing, you know, with your nerve system. So you consciously move something different. Now that when I look at a, at a UAP, you know, it almost, it almost feels like a vehicle for consciousness moving at will through space and time to me. Mm -hmm. there are esoteric traditions that would completely agree with what you're talking about um and it's i think if as long as we're speculating it's it's safe to wonder um could advanced consciousness create a vehicle with its consciousness to transit the universe and our uap of the nuts and bolts variety um an effort to replicate what is actually, you know, a, a vehicle of higher consciousness? I think that's a fascinating um, question. Um, I, I'm not unfamiliar with lucid dreaming. Um, uh, uh, I think a lot of people would consider that what you're um, you're discussing, or possibly even some people might call it astral projection. Um, I have no problem with all the words. I'm okay with, you know, semantics. I know is is a trap for most of us anyway. So we have to do the best we can to convey our ideas to each other. Right. right. Um, there's an overlap with the phenomenon. There is an overlap with the experiencer community and things that we call sleep paralysis, lucid dreaming, astral oh, projection. I had you know, that. It's oh. frightening. It's frightening, oh, but man, it's, it's there's a horrible. It's a question of whether we're actually having an experience that's worth conveying in a 3D day to day fashion whether we're having a, a dream or whether you're interfacing with a level of reality that is real, but not tangible. Again, those are, you know, those are great questions, but um, I don't know how we prove those subtle things to each other. Well, I, I, I talked to Lou a little bit about that and you know uh, what, what, what he explained. Let me first thank Will uh, for donating and uh, I'll ask your question in a second. Um, so uh, Lou, you know, when you talk about, you know, the, these vehicles uh, being able to ma manipulate, probably being able to ma manipulate uh, gravity and uh, bending space and time. That's why they seem to appear and disappear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you've witnessed and, and David witnessed, um, you know, I, I, I think there might be a correlation there, but you know, I'm just a spiritual idiot and, uh, you know, talking about this. 
um, but let me get to to uh, Will's question. Sean, what do you think about the Zimbabwe school landing? The ETs allegedly sent a pretty clear message about protecting our planet to those children at the at school the, at the time. It, I I'm not offended by the idea that we should protect our planet. Um, I, I am, I'm, I believe that we can progress without feeling the need to litter or dump toxic, uh, things into our water or pollute ourselves on purpose. But I also think that we have to be grown ups as a society and as a civilization. And when we discover that we've made mistakes, we have to fix them. So, um, what do, I think that it's, if that's the agenda of who landed at Zimbabwe, um, I find it an agenda that I can help support. It's a very random and ineffective means of, of having your agenda be successful by meeting with school children in a spaceship. Um, and, and if we follow up with those children, it seems like all that did was end up con causing a great many of them consternation in their lives. Um, so again, what's going on here that that's the best way to do this? Uh, you know that so that that's my opinions on it i'm very confused by that yeah it's a fascinating event you know especially with um, because there were so many witnesses mm -hmm. i think 60 to 100 kids saw that you know um mm -hmm. that was crazy i i know for a fact uh a filmmaker james fox you know um he, he uh, gave a lot of attention to that case in uh, the phenomenon great film yes um also uh i got uh um uh, got my hand on some of that footage not not the footage uh you know james showed but uh there was a dutch film crew who went there a year after and interviewed those kids and i got that footage uh mm. I, I shared it with uh yeah 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 it was for a paranormal for a paranormal show and you know they were talking to the to the kids about it and mm. it was quite 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 uh interesting yeah, it's very moving and it's very different. I mean, we have a lot of different flavors. That happens sometimes, but we have other things that happen with completely different reports. So that's one of the, another one of the reasons that I don't speak about this as a single point um, phenomenon. I think we're dealing with either a spectrum or a grouping or, or many different things at once. Right. So my buddy NMUAP uh, donated again, I think for the third time. You're a warrior, dude. I love you. <laughs> I the beers tonight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sean, how common are fast movers? And have you ever seen sonar data on that? So I can only give you off the record um, conversations that I've had with colleagues and friends who were uh, in the submarine and sonar community in the last couple of years. Um, I'm not usually one to just throw something out there. I can't back up, but they said they see them all the time. Um, I haven't seen the data. Um, I've talked to a couple of the sonar guys from Princeton. I've talked to a couple of um, submariners that were uh, up around the what we call the dew line, the early uh, warning network um, during the Cold War. And they all have told me that the in the submarine community, it's pretty commonplace um, and they don't enter them into the logs usually. Uh, they often they say a phrase, log it and dog it. And what that means is, is you're, you're just not even going to put it in the log. It didn't happen. Right. Now, Sean, uh, you must have seen what uh, Jeremy Corbell, filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, has been releasing in the last couple of weeks. You know, uh, I think it was actually from the, was it from the Nimitz again? No. Uh, the Omaha. 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 Yeah. Now, that, that must have been from uh, like, a, you know, uh, like a coming home for you. Right, but how did you? Well, I, for me, it's 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 not as exciting as it is to a lot of people, and that that goes. No offense to Mr. Corbell, um, he's done a lot of great work for this community, but without a chain of custody that the rest of us can see, without an origin and an eyewitness account, and all of the other things that would go along with a proper investigation, all we have is a single point piece of evidence and right. an anecdotal report. So as an investigator, I can't do anything with it. And so then we're stuck with armchair uh, skeptics being able to pick it apart and say whatever they want to about it because we don't have the data that should be backing it up to tell us what we're looking at. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I hope Jeremy, you know, and, and I, I know him a little bit. I know he really wants to, you know, uh, d d disclose everything he has, but... I feel he's being, uh, he has to contain himself for, for a little bit right now, but I, I expect some more. But I wonder I'll be, why. I'll be 
<laughs> yeah. But why he's not telling right now? Well, I wonder what's I mean? the why are we why the slow drip? Why why, why the we, slow I drip? I thought we were going to I thought we were going to put this all in the daylight. What are we doing? Cuz my my investigation, I can't I can't help Mr. Corbell by commenting on those videos without that information. Right. They right. might as well be a TikTok somebody emailed me. Right. Okay. Well, you know, it would be great, but you know, there was some data uh, there, uh, like the radar data they, they, they showed. But, you know, yeah, you need uh, names and numbers uh, to come along with that. So, yeah, I hope Jeremy is going to come up with that. It would be, uh, you know, making his case much stronger. It'd be very helpful. Yeah, very helpful. But, you know, I'll be talking to him soon. So uh, I'll, I hope uh, we can, uh, you know, I'll, get some I'll more. I'll throw you five bucks for a question for that one. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, you don't have to no. know. <laughs> uh, you might, you know, if you want, uh, join us, you know, could be cool. Maybe if I have time, we will. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I have another question, you know, uh, a personal question, actually. Um, <clears throat> now, um, you've stated you you uh, are suffering or have suffered from PTSD from uh, because of your military years. Um, now, does your activism for the for the UAP disclosure uh, uh, play a role in in that? You know, you is 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 that something that goes hand in hand? Yeah. Um... Well, my, my PTSD is not related to, to UAP or my experiences with that. Um, not at, le at least not in my, uh, my, you know, military and disability sense. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's so simple to see what it takes, um, to destroy a person by not giving them the validation of their experience, um, by, by telling them to suck it up and to move on and to, uh, and, and and just take it and we live in a world where we haven't we haven't solved war yet and i live in a country where war is it has been a part of our daily existence for the last nearly a, with very small breaks for our entire existence but definitely right, the last yeah. 20 or so years so yeah. all of my colleagues all of my friends all of my neighbors they're all veterans um almost everyone i know is is qualified in tactical movement and and, and weapons and, and handling uh, tactics. Um, and we were given a lot of tools to go do a job. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people who thinks we let our veterans down. I think we try really hard, but I don't think we know what they need. And our veterans need validation. They don't need, a, they don't need to be thanked for their service. That we, we did that, we volunteered to do that. It's, it's not something we were doing for thanks. What we would like is to help our brothers and sisters who are out there on the street who, who can't handle their business anymore. And there's folks within the UFO community that are experiencing that same level of post-traumatic trauma after, after what they've been through. It was like they were yeah. in a war for them. So, yeah, that drives me very strongly. Right, right. Now, uh, Sean, you are helping people out in the chat uh, because Mav uh, says uh, your voice is lowering her blood pressure. So thank you for your service. That's, that's, that's my pleasure. <laughs> um, so Sean, um, do you talk to to a lot of people uh, about you know um, you know what do you feel about this and and what and what their experiences are? You know, is there like a uh, community like that? I have a lot of close knit friends um, that I check in with every day. Uh, some that I check in with every week. Some, some less. Um, but yes, we do share our observations with each other. Uh, we share our personal observations about what we experience uh, in our lives. For a lot of us, the phenomenon isn't a one point source. It's an ongoing um, fascination in a lot of ways. Uh, it comes and goes. It ebbs and flows, very much like the the rest of our lives. But um, keeping in touch with each other and supporting each other is very much a part of my day yes okay um uh, so we're gonna you know uh we're almost done i'm not gonna take too much more of your time but uh thank you so much um so you're an in investigator you're a filmmaker uh you talk to a lot of people who have seen things now are there any 
compelling cases uh, that are unknown up until now you stumbled over that you could maybe uh, elaborate about? Maybe there's some footage, maybe there's some data. When Luis Elizondo and I went down to Ensenada in Mexico and then subsequently afterward out to Guadalupe Island, we took about 100 hours, 100 plus hours worth of um, <clears throat> interviews with people, with fishermen um, who do this, who were out there on the water every day, um, and some who, who have been doing it for upwards of 70 years. Um, once we got out to Guadalupe Island and we interviewed the fishermen there and the scientists, it became apparent to me that that area is is an incredible hotspot of activity to a point where it even, it looks almost like a science fiction movie to these folks sometimes. Wow. Um, I would love to see a subsequent investigation go out there, um, possibly in cooperation with the, the Mexican government to set up some kind of um, permanent observation station, perhaps on Guadalupe yeah. Island, something non-invasive, but there does seem to be something going on out there. And I don't think it needs, the, the fishermen are not alarmed. Um, the, the rumors that I'm getting of the, the ships that are returning, the sailors are confused, but not alarmed. Um, so I, I don't believe this is going to be the simple answer of Russian or Chinese spoofing. It may be in some cases, but there's something very interesting going on. Um, and it's, it's very compelling to me. And I, I think that, that all of us are, are um, we're going to benefit from, from continuing this conversation and reducing the stigma and inviting more people to the table. But, you know, you, you've been there uh, with Lou and you, you guys uh, talked to people, investigated a little bit. Uh, th is there like phone footage uh, they made or uh, anything? Well, we didn't collect any when we were down there, but we did talk to groups of people because there was one point during the, the, the footing or excuse me, the filming of our uh, episode down there where the local cartel folks thought that we were a uh, drug enforcement agency um, and that our, that we were faking filming. So we actually could... Lou was, <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the heck out of Dodge. We, he and I actually, we did an egress and went back to the hotel and ended up meeting with the consulate to try to squash this. But when we, oh, we asked all the service folks at the hotel, come on out and show, you know, we said, we're the UFO folks We're that's really what we're doing. So we showed them, you show us our videos. We'll show you yours. Everyone had videos. Everyone had UAP that they had witnessed in the sky around Ensenada on their phone. The entire staff of the of, of the kitchen and wait staff that came out to talk to us. Um, That's it. When I, I know where my idea is going to be. When I was on Catalina, the same thing. When I was there with Gary Voorhees to film Expedition X, we got out of the shuttle and I said, watch this, bro. Hey, who's seen a UFO recently? Three guys came out with their phones, a crew of painters, and they were, they were watching them all weekend go back and forth over the house they were at. So I didn't have a chance yes. to collect these things, but there's people everywhere. So we've, we've, we're, doing, we're working on some things behind the scenes to get a place for people to send their data to where it will be checked by machine learning and then, and then, right. and then remain where the rest of us can look at it, you know, and, and where we and, can... Go ahead, And please. sir, are you... Are, are, are you uh, making a film or a documentary about this anytime soon? We've got a lot of things going on. Um, it, it's it's so very busy Come right on, now. Sean. Come on, Sean. Come on. We've uh, we've uh, me and a couple of friends have formed a company that we'll be announcing very soon. We formed it originally to uh, to support Luis, and now we found a larger mission supporting other folks and expanding the conversation. So there are a lot of things that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at ways to get the entire story of a tip out there. We're looking at ways to get some individual stories about what they've seen out there. Um, we're looking at ways to expand this out into multimedia and expand the conversation by bringing in influencers and celebrities and asking them to discuss their, um, their involvement with this, what they've observed in their lives. We're really looking to just get more people to talk about this. This isn't for us to decide how the conversation goes. We just want to spill the cards out on the table and everybody can help us shuffle them back up into a deck. Awesome. Now, uh, I'm just going to openly uh, uh, ap uh, apply for this uh, uh, position because I am a documentary filmmaker. I have an IMDb um, and I really would love to do, may I do something uh, with this so well, let's stay guys, in touch let's you, do that if you guys need anything i'll be your dude um, max everybody i've talked to loves loves talking to you they love the way that you approach this subject they love the way that you interface with it 
So absolutely, man. I would love to do something with you on this. Oh, cool, Sean. You know what? We'll talk. <laughs> um, let's see. Is there anything, anything you would like to address or, uh, you know, um, make notice of before we go? Yeah. Um, a lot of times we get lost uh, in, in, in that we're finally here on this pinnacle, able to have this conversation uh, on national news and international news sources. And, and we're finally, we finally have the, the attention of the people that may be able to change this. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that a very good friend of mine is being railroaded by a portion of the government right now. Um, they erased Lou's emails. They're trying to make it so he didn't exist. They tried to say he didn't run a tip. They tried to say that he had nothing to do with it. That's bullshit. And we, we've got Senator Harry Reid backing us up. We've got all of the data backing us up. And now they're trying to destroy the data. Somebody's got to get a hold of these turkeys and find out what they're doing. This is absolutely unacceptable. And they're doing it in broad daylight. And unfortunately, sometimes I think that what you and I are doing here in the greater news cycle is going to actually really eclipse the fact that they're screwing somebody right now, right in the middle yeah. of the square. Yeah, I think somebody should smack them in the face with a Bible. But <laughs> I don't know if I should have said that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what? On that note, uh, Sean, it was a great pleasure and a big honor to talk to you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for, uh, you know, letting me talk to you. And, uh, well, I hope to do this many more times. And uh, Just let me know, Max. I'd love to talk to you again. All right, sir. Well, talk to you soon. Thank you. Ciao. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.